So I'm Dr. Dory Howard, and my specialism is in popular music studies. So for that reason, my focus is much less on score-based analysis and more on cultural and historical um, contextual approaches to understanding popular music. So uh, today I want to try looking at some of the work of Kate Bush in that way. So there's obviously a reason why these three songs, Cloud Busting, and Dream of Sheep, and Under Ice, have been chosen as Ed Excel set works. They're clearly considered important, notable, and worthwhile pieces for us to be discussing them even 33 years after they were released. But why? Asking a question like this usually gets a response along the lines of, because Kate Bush is a musical genius, or the songs were ahead of their time. But answers like that take for granted important elements of history and culture. And answers like that don't tell us the entire story. The reason that we're all here right now discussing these works can be partially understood through a discussion of the context of the work. What was happening in and around 1985 when they were released can give us important information about how to go about analyzing these works. So today I want to focus on three particular contexts. First, Kate Bush's career. Second, the popular music landscape when Kate Bush released Hounds of Love. And third, the technology that affected her work. So let's start with her career. Hounds of Love, the album that contained Cloud Busting and Dream of Sheep and Under Ice, was released in September of 1985, and it was Kate Bush's fifth album. Her first album was released seven years earlier in 1978, when she was 19 years old. The single from that album, Wuthering Heights, was a huge hit. It was both commercially successful, so it made lots of money and sold a lot of copies, but it was also critically successful, so authorities on music had really good things to say about it. And her success is interesting to think about if we consider her in the context of another pop artist from the same time period, Madonna, who could, we could consider as one of Kate Bush's contemporaries. Both of them had huge hits in the UK throughout the 1980s. They were both women working in a very male-dominated industry. They were both commercially and critically successful. But Kate Bush garnered an interesting type of authenticity and respect in the sense that she wrote her own music and lyrics, whereas Madonna worked with collaborators and songwriters. Now, by making this comparison, I'm definitely not saying that Kate Bush is better than Madonna or that her music is better because she wrote her own songs, because that would be an unfair and basically impossible kind of comparison to make. Madonna garnered her own kind of authenticity and respect. So instead, what I'm trying to illustrate is the way that they both occupied an interesting niche as women working in an incredibly male-dominated music industry, and that they occupied it in different ways. So to illustrate, Kate Bush was the very first female artist to achieve a UK number one single with a self-written song. And the idea of a single is important because during this time period, singles were often associated with radio-friendly music, while albums were kind of associated with more sort of serious music. So towards the beginning of her career, Kate Bush was considered a pop musician making accessible music in a typical popular music format. Um, one of those types of formats that easily lended itself to radio listening. Eventually, though, she also became the first solo British female artist to enter the UK album charts. So over the course of her career, there's this slow change from being considered sort of a pop musician to being considered a more serious pop musician. And the notion of seriousness surrounding Kate Bush also had to do with her use of intertextuality. So intertextuality is a term used to describe an interconnectedness among different pieces of work or texts. So a text can be a song or a book, 
a performance, a poem, a film, a play, basically anything that we can kind of read and interpret. So intertextuality is the way that texts can be connected together. And it's often used to help an audience create connections between pieces of work to help us more fully understand the work that we're focusing on at the time. Kate Bush has used intertextuality a lot throughout her body of work. Her song Wuthering Heights is clearly interconnected to Emily Bronte's novel of the same name. For many listeners, it's difficult to separate the song Wuthering Heights from the novel Wuthering Heights. They work together to communicate a particular meaning to audiences. Another example is the name of the second half of Hounds of Love. Now, Hounds of Love is split into two distinct parts. So first you've got Hounds of Love, and then you have the Ninth Wave. So the Ninth Wave comes from a poem by Lord Alfred Tennyson. And Kate Bush has said in several interviews that she composed the Ninth Wave as if it were a short film. And this is another interesting use of intertextuality that's common in her career which included music videos that could be interpreted as short films that incorporated specific elements of dance and drama. So in this way, she occupied an interesting space within popular music that was recognized by listeners as being both accessible and radio-friendly on the one hand, but also sort of seen as serious music on the other hand. Now this is important for us to consider in the progression of her career, because again, she was a very young woman working in a very male-dominated field. She was working in an industry which would have expected a man, or even lots of men, from her record label to guide her music and her career, to make decisions for her, and to control her creative process. But as Kate Bush garnered more and more clout through the successes of her first three albums, the more autonomy, freedom, and control she was able to garner from her record label. To the point that by her fourth album, called The Dreaming, she was able to produce it herself with very little interference from her record label. On The Dreaming, she used her freedom to experiment a lot with production techniques and musical styles, including the use of the Fairlight CMI, which you can see behind me here. And we'll discuss that in just a few minutes. But when The Dreaming was released, audiences who were used to the sort of pop star Kate Bush were a bit confused by the inaccessibility of the weird soundscapes that she'd created, and critics were mostly kind of unimpressed. It didn't flop by any means. Um, it reached number six on the album charts. But there were no discernible radio singles from it, nothing that stood out for radio play so it wasn't nearly as successful as her previous albums. So when we start to try to analyze these set works from Hounds of Love, it's important to bear in mind that Kate Bush started making the Hounds of Love album just after she'd released her most unsuccessful record to date, because it makes sense that she was probably thinking about the fact that she had just released her most unsuccessful record. So she was still able to exert most of the control over Hounds of Love, perhaps even more so than with The Dreaming, because by this point, she'd had a studio built at her home, which she used for the entire recording process of Hounds of Love, instead of using the studios that were owned by her record label. But before we get into a discussion of the album, I'd like to take a minute to think about another context which is the musical landscape in the UK at the time. Musically, there was a lot going on. So Madonna, who I mentioned before, was really popular, um, as were musicians like Cyndi Lauper and Whitney Houston, groups like Duran Duran. Also around this same time, world music had become an official genre created by music marketers to account for this increasing interest that many audiences had in sort of non-Western styles of music. Ethnic and indigenous instrumentation was of particular interest to lots of different musicians. And this interest is reflected in some of Kate Bush's work. Cloud busting uses a balalaika, a traditional Russian instrument. 
Um, and Dream of Sheep includes the bouzouki, an instrument traditionally found in Greek music. You also had um, styles of dance music that were emerging from different parts of the UK, new wave and post-punk that used synthesizers and electronic elements. So there's a lot of different types of things going on within the popular music landscape, including lots of different types of technology. And technology is really important for us to think about in this context. So there's a very good Kate Bush scholar, Ron Moy, who suggests that the three set works that we're looking at today came from a particular period that was bridging an era between largely acoustic and musicianly methods common earlier, and an era of digital programming and hard disk recording about to be embarked upon. So in other words, it's a good example of a work which was released around the time that popular music was moving from mostly using analog or acoustic elements to a time when digital technology was becoming more and more commonplace. This is evident if we think about the fact that 1985 is also the year that the band Dire Straits released the album Brothers in Arms. And this is significant because it was the very first album that was released on CD in the UK. Now the CD would have been considered a rather cutting edge listening format at this time. It was a digital technology. So Brothers in Arms was released in May of 1985. Hounds of Love was released five months later in September. But it can be argued that while Kate Bush embraced many types of technology, she probably didn't keep this new listening format at the forefront of her mind while making Hounds of Love. Obviously, I'm not Kate Bush, so I can't say that for sure. But the reason that I say this is because of the way that the album is set up. So as I mentioned before, Hounds of Love is essentially divided into two distinctive parts. The first half includes five tracks that are more radio friendly and similar to kind of Kate Bush's earlier, more accessible work. One of these tracks is Cloud Busting, which was released as the second single from the album. The second half, which contains And Dream of Sheep and Under Ice, is called The Ninth Wave. It has seven tracks that all have a unifying theme, a suite of songs that's often referred to as a mini concept album. Now, a concept album was nothing new within popular music, but it was a really interesting choice for this point in time. Because while concept albums were very popular in the late 1960s and early 1970s, by 1985, they were largely considered kind of uncool and not really in vogue. So one way that this division of the album works is that it allowed Kate Bush to continue the experimentation from her previous album, The Dreaming, without alienating audiences who preferred her more accessible, radio-friendly songs from earlier in her career. But the division between the two parts of the album also reinforces the idea that it was probably not composed with CD technology in mind. With a vinyl record, you can play one side, or you could flip it to the other. And a cassette would probably work in a similar way. But a CD doesn't. Um, it wouldn't really be physically possible to sort of divide the CD unless it was released as two separate discs, which it wasn't. So the album did end up being released on all three formats. Um, and it would be really interesting to see which format actually sold the most copies. So one type of new digital technology that Kate Bush did embrace at the time was the Fairlight CMI, which she used a lot on The Dreaming and also on Hounds of Love. The Fairlight is a kind of digital audio workstation that includes a digital synthesizer and sampler. Kate Bush continued to use the Fairlight throughout her career, even after new types of synthesizer and digital technology became available. Now, there are lots of different scholarly opinions about why she did this, but it might be argued that the fair light became a part of her signature sound. Today, digital sound is a huge part of popular music. It's so commonplace that sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between what's programmed and what's played. 
and I'd venture to guess that sometimes we don't even really think about the difference when we hear music on the radio. But Kate Bush was among some of the first musicians to navigate this type of technology found in the Fairlight, though not necessarily the first. Other musicians like Peter Gabriel, Hans Zimmer, and Thomas Dolby also used the Fairlight. The Fairlight allowed musicians to put sound recordings into a digital format like a floppy disk instead of analog formats like tape. Musicians could control the pitch of the sound and manipulate the recording in a much easier way than they could with tape, which was very, it was a very intricate, time-consuming process with tape because the tape had to be cut and then sort of put back together. With the Fairlight, it was all done through digital computer technology. So let's have a look at how the Fairlight actually works. So we are here with Cliff Bradbury from Keele University, and he's going to show us a little bit about how the Fairlight CMI works. Uh, the Fairlight CMI is probably the world's first commercially available sampler. It was introduced uh, around about 1979. It's, uh, with it being a sampler, it'll take real sounds, um, digitize them, put them into memory, and then you're able to play them back on the keyboard. So we can switch it on and get it, uh, get it fired up. Okay, we'll now have a look at the sound sampling page. So you can see I've got the microphone here. We've got the display here, so it's actually registering. So we'll give it a try. Oh. So that's a, a sample of a voice, which becomes a little bit more interesting when it's pl played lower down in the octaves. It could almost be another instrument in its own right, I guess. Interestingly enough, this uh, was designed around two 8-inch floppy disks, and uh, these only hold about half a meg to probably maximum one meg of RAM, so very small compared to today's standards. Uh, this one here has had the floppy disk removed, and it's now been updated to an SD drive. So, to load a sound up, we need to just choose one of the sounds. Right, this is a saxophone sound, so it should be a little bit of a breath at the start there. Again, it probably going to a loop. And you can see it, well, you can hear the characteristic uh, breathiness of a, a saxophone sound. Apart from sampling, it will actually do a lot of synthesis, which it was originally designed to do. So what you've got is a light pen here, uh, which enables you to draw on the screen. Um, we can use it for um, harmonic synthesis or using harmonic profiles and doing uh, a compute and see what we can come up with. Um, so we've got some harmonics in the harmonic series 1 to 32. We can just select these and we can just either do a wave shape like that We won't make them straight because the sound is not as interesting. So if we compute that, we should have something. That sounds like that. What we can do, we can go to another page. Uh, on this page, we can alter a lot of the parameters of the sound. For instance, there's loop control off. So we can put that on. We can put loop start onto one of the controls. So that same sound, we can now control with some faders on the keyboard.
going round. Okay, um, what we'll have a look at now is a later uh, addition to the Fairlight, and it was called Page R. And the idea behind Page R was to introduce a sequencing section into the Fairlight. Uh, the Fairlight had always had um, the ability to play more than one note, or it was eight note polyphonic. And if you can see on here, which is what's called Page 3, this is the register control you can actually load eight different sounds into eight different registers. So the idea of a sequencer is that the sequencer can then access each of those registers and play them like, um, like an eight note sequencer. Very limited compared to today's uh, sequences, of course, but this was just limited to eight. What I've done here then is loaded up what's called an instrument file and it's loaded different sounds into the different registers. But if you look here, it says Emphony. They've all got an Emphony of one, which means you can only play one note on that sound. If you'd loaded one sound with an Emphony of eight, then you could play eight notes. We'll go to page R, and this is where the sequence file is uh, loaded in. And you can see the, the, the sounds and which, what it's going to be playing and you've got a selection of notes which you program in and you've got this little sequence here so we can just play a bit of it. the nice thing about the Fairlight was that you could go along to a recording studio and you're taking along a whole load of instruments whereas right. traditionally you'd have an idea uh, well we need a sax playing on this and we need perhaps um, some string sounds but this enabled you to go along to a recording studio and take a whole collection of instruments with you all on so your floppy desk yeah. so it gave <laughs> the producer this versatility of trying out all the different sounds and of course this introduced problems initially with the musicians union who were very worried about the fact that uh, all the members of their union would be out of work right which never really happened but it was certainly a, an initial worry so now that you've seen how the fairlight works um we can think about how when the fairlight was first developed the idea was that you were taking sounds from sort of the natural world, things that we know what they sound like. A timpani drum sounded like a real timpani drum. Um, a sound of a dog barking sounded like a dog barking. Um, the fair light was meant to replicate sounds from sort of real life. But what Kate Bush did with the fair light was to manipulate the sounds so that they sounded like something besides instruments. So she used it more for creating atmospheric and imaginative soundscapes, things that were meant to sound strange or magical or unusual that you wouldn't necessarily hear in your real life. Rather than using it simply to replicate or reproduce the sounds of certain instruments. From a closer listening of the songs on Hounds of Love, it becomes apparent that Kate Bush picked up on the atmospheric possibilities of the Fairlight early on, and you can hear it very clearly in Under Ice. As soon as the strings come in, it's apparent to the ear that maybe those are not real strings. The illusion of strings that sounds slightly more programmed, so digital, than actually played or acoustic, add to the feeling, the affect, that communicates the meaning of the song. It's from the perspective of a person who is dreaming that she's trapped under ice. And the digital atmosphere that Kate Bush has created lends itself to the idea of, of existing in a world of the non-real because it uses non-real sounds. So let's listen to it now. And the digital atmosphere that Kate Bush has lended, sorry, 
all off on one. All right. <laughs> and the digital atmosphere that Kate Bush has created lends itself to the idea of existing in a world of the non-real because it uses non-real sounds. And that idea of real and non-real sounds is definitely something that you should listen for the next time that you listen to Under Ice. And I think that it's really interesting, the idea of real and non-real sounds. Of course, any sound is real if we hear it. Um, but we're talking about sounds that occur in the natural world and sounds that are digitally created. And I think that Kate Bush is very good about deciding how and where in her music to use the fair light and digital instrumentations. So if we consider one of the other set works then, Cloud Busting, she uses the fair light and digital aspects in an entirely different way. Strings are very important within cloud busting. And I think it's really interesting that she didn't write these parts for real strings. Instead, she composed the string parts on the fair light, adjusted and manipulated it the way that she wanted, and then transcribed it for real strings. So the choice to use real strings then was an intentional one. Again, I'm not Kate Bush, so I can't say for sure, but I would venture to guess that it was used to reflect the content of this particular song, which, like so much of her other work, is intertextual. So intertextuality, again, is very important. Uh, do you remember when I mentioned at the beginning that one of the reasons that people often suggest that Kate Bush's music is long-lasting is because she's a musical genius? Intertextuality helps us to put that statement into perspective because it shows us that her ideas didn't just sort of appear out of nowhere in this kind of genius way. Instead, it reinforces the fact that all musicians and artists and people are shaped and influenced by the culture and context around them. We don't exist in a vacuum. There's always some sort of collaborative effort that exists through the way that artistic or musical works influence each other. In the case of cloud busting, Kate Bush was influenced by another work called The Book of Dreams, which was a memoir written by Peter Reich about his relationship with his father. His father, Willem Reich, was a controversial figure in the field of psychiatry. He was a student of Sigmund Freud, so he worked in the psychiatric field of psychoanalysis. One of his ideas was that it was possible to harness people's energy, which he called orgon, and that the energy was so powerful that it could be used to control the weather and make it rain. So he created machines that harnessed this energy, and they were called cloud busters. They could bust the clouds and make it rain. His research was incredibly controversial for a variety of reasons too complex to go into uh, for our reasons today. But in the end, the US government intervened, accusing him of fraud. They banned and burned most of his books and his work and his machines, and they arrested him. And he ended up dying alone in prison. So the Book of Dreams is written from the perspective of his son, Peter who's looking back on his childhood and reflecting on his relationship with his father. So Kate Bush said in 1985, the book is written through a child's eyes, looking at his father and how much his father means to him in the world. He's everything. There's a wonderful sense of magic as he and his father make it rain together with this machine. The book is full of imagery of an innocent child and yet it's being written by a sad adult, which gives it a strange kind of personal intimacy and magic that's quite extraordinary. The song is really about how much that father meant to the son and how much he misses him now that he's gone. So when you listen to Cloud Busting, it's interesting and important to think about how there's a tendency sometimes within popular music writing to use words such as warm or cold to describe music and sounds. Words like this are loaded with meaning and connotation. These terms can mean different things to different people because how do you take the temperature of something like music? But traditionally, music made with acoustic and musicianly instruments are often described as warm, 
while digital or electronic sounds are interpreted as having kind of a cold feel to them. The decision then to use real strings, the Medici sextet, to record a song about the magical relationship between a father and a son, seems as though it could be a deliberate use of warmer sounds to reflect that relationship. The same with Under Ice. The song is composed almost entirely of digital sounds. What better way to convey the coldness of being trapped under ice or the otherworldliness of being caught up in a dream world? It's both effective and affective in the message that it's trying to convey. It sounds and feels cold, imposing, slightly ominous, in the same way that cloud busting feels warm, welcoming, and safe. I would argue that much of this is down to the nuanced way that Kate Bush chose to use the technology of the Fairlight to communicate the content of her songs. I think it's also interesting, just to mention quickly before I finish up, that she also used the Fairlight for practical reasons rather than just as a means of creative communication. If you listen to the end of Cloud Busting, there's the sound of a train. Kate Bush and her band members decided to use the train sound to end the song because they couldn't come up with a way to end it naturally. So they essentially just covered up the music with a sampled sound effect to make the transition into the ending smoother for the listener. So sometimes technology like this was to use to convey and communicate a very specific idea and atmosphere, but other times it was used for practical reasons. So to sum up, it's important for us to keep in mind that context is vitally important to understanding any type of musical work. One of the many reasons that we're still discussing these works today is because rather than being ahead of her time, Kate Bush utilized what was available to her at her time. She was able to use composition and production methods very particular to the time period during which she was making music. And these set works could not have been made at any other point in time than when they were actually made. Equally, again, rather than being ahead of her time, Kate Bush was of her time. While it can be argued that we still have a lot of room for improvement even today when it comes to female representation in popular music, we have to recognize and acknowledge that she was creating music in a period of time when women were not nearly as visible as songwriters and creatives in the music industry as they are today. <laughs>